So do you think with how much I love Final Fantasy Tactics, I would have played Tactics Ogre long ago? But nope. I've put it off with other important things in life, like getting a real job or learning how to talk to women. With Yasumi Masuno at the helm of both Tactics games, I came in expecting to fall in love with Tactics Ogre Reborn. And of course, there were also the adoring fans of the series, singing endless praises of the previous iteration, Let Us Cling Together. However, that was not the case. It wasn't a letdown, far from it, as it is one of the better tactical RPGs I've played in a while. But there was something about the whole experience that didn't quite hit the mark. Maybe that's my Final Fantasy nostalgia talking though. The heart and soul of any tactical RPG is the combat. It's the defining feature that determines whether the game is worth diving into, and Reborn did have some highlights that made it shine. For one, it offered a challenge that few in the genre could match outside of Fire Emblem. The level cap combined with enemies typically having stronger loadouts and sometimes even larger squads meant they had a good handicap to balance out their underperforming AI. While Square Enix has made improvements to their intelligence, it's still not smarter than a 5th grader. Of course, at times, the difficulty did lead to some frustration when I would get stuck on an encounter for hours. Like the time I died to the final boss and realized I came in completely unprepared, causing hours of my time to be wasted. I was so salty, I almost just dropped the game entirely. Definitely a monkey's paw moment. In addition to the challenge, there were a few combat mechanics I really enjoyed. The buff card system made battles more dynamic by randomly spawning buffs that could be picked up around the map, making each decision even more important. Situations often crop up where I had to choose between running away from the front lines to grab a buff, or moving to an ideal attack position and ignoring the buff, potentially letting enemies get to it. Although most of the time, the AI isn't smart enough to steal my buffs, but if they do, it feels bad. It was also cool to see it utilized to give bosses their own fully stacked set of buffs at the beginning to make them even more deadly. To make matters more interesting, every ability depended on the scarce commodity of MP, which changed how I fought enemies. With MP starting at zero and recovering a tiny bit at the start of each turn, I couldn't just come in with my crew swords blazing. I had to decide how to use the little resource I had available. Do I use an item to recover more, save it so I can use stronger abilities later, or do I use what I have now to put some damage on the table? All this extra weight carried by each decision helped supplement the difficulty and led to engaging battles. With so much perceived emphasis on making the correct moves, it's a bit surprising they also implemented a way to undo all the mistakes by turning back time with the Chariot Tarot. Normally, I would be adamantly against using such a handicap for my own playthrough, but the terrible recruitment system forced my hand. With each failed attempt at persuasion, the likelihood that an enemy will convert plummets. A really dumb cost of failure if I do say so myself. And worst of all, this isn't reflected in the predictions, which makes it even more irritating. Speaking of dumb things, I don't get why changing classes requires a consumable item. Maybe I'm spoiled by Final Fantasy, but it feels like a pointless barrier when the basic items can easily be bought from the shop, and there's not much of a point changing special classes since skills don't generally transfer anyway. This last tidbit was actually a little bit disappointing because it was one of the reasons I like tactics so much. It's also a little inconvenient that I could only see abilities of a class a character is assigned to, so initially I didn't know what any of them did. Character builds were fairly restrictive in other ways as well, with skills, spell, and item slots being limited to 4. The idea is actually interesting in theory, forcing me to strategize about taking only the most useful tools for the upcoming encounter. In practice though, it served as more of a hindrance than a boon. It was just an annoying time sink to constantly swap between the same few items and abilities depending on what's on the field. The skills are different enough where I'm not actually forced to choose between any of them because only a handful are useful for any specific encounter anyway. Similarly, there were a few other mechanics that had the potential to create some interesting interactions that would influence decision making, but overall was more of a get it and forget it kind of deal. Gears have resistances to many different types of weapons, races, and spells which would have been cool to incorporate into strategies to counteract what the enemies have, but I found it to be insignificant and not worth the effort. I always upgraded to the strongest options available without a second thought. Even for endgame gear, it was just stacking on as many stats as possible. Units also have an elemental property which increases damage of spells with the same element, and again, like gear, there was minimal conscious interaction with the system other than making sure the spells matched the unit's affinity. 
there was also an elemental weakness ecosystem, but the damage bonus and penalty wasn't big enough to pay attention to. Despite the good things combat had to offer, the lack of more intricate mechanics caused it to eventually devolve into just rushing in and focusing down enemies with my strongest attacks. That's okay for a while, but it quickly got to the point I was so bored I was occasionally falling asleep during fights. I even started to let the AI autopilot whatever encounters I could, though even that wasn't foolproof. It was slightly annoying that I still had to somewhat pay attention since any dialogue box that appears needed to be dismissed manually, which is dumb since auto advance is a thing, but it doesn't work here for some reason. I am grateful there's a turbo function to make combat go faster, otherwise it would feel really dragged out. If it wasn't for the AI, I don't think I would have gotten through as much of the game as I did. It's massive, with so many secrets hidden in every nook and cranny, and reaching some of those places required a bit of legwork. Like with the 100th floor Palace of the Dead, which I just found out is what the Final Fantasy XIV Deep Dungeon is based off of. The endgame is actually when things started getting even more interesting since this is where the entirety of the game is unlocked, and the most powerful gear can be found. As someone who always plays blind, I would normally get pretty upset about the amount of missable content, but with the World Tarot letting me go back to key parts of the game, nothing is truly missable. It's way better than what a typical New Game Plus has to offer, and it didn't require me to replay the game from the beginning to explore the entirety of this intricate story. There were often important choices that dictated the direction of the narrative. It's a zero-sum game where allying with one person makes an enemy of someone else, so all those perspectives and characters are lost. I still haven't had the time to explore all there is to see in Tactics Ogre. Yet. But I really like what I've seen so far in the world of Valeria. It's huge, and quite frankly, a bit overwhelming for a new player like myself. During expositions, they name drop nations and people like it's supposed to be common sense to know who they are. Just going through the beginning of the game made me nostalgic of tactics because I was also just as clueless when starting off in that game. It took me a couple of playthroughs before I really got what was going on in the War of the Lions, and I feel like that definitely applies here as well. It doesn't help that some story characters look exactly the same as the generic units but with a palette swap. Combined with the pixel art that's been smoothed over by the dreaded smoothing filter every developer loves to use, any semblance of individuality is lost. Seriously though, these guys look like they took a Game Boy Advance sprite, blew them up, and added a blur. They even had the audacity to say that they not only preserved the detailed pixel art, but enhanced it too. I get that it's a remaster, and not a remake so I won't get the beautiful HD 2D style Octopath Traveler has, but at least give me the option to turn smoothing off. Although I didn't have enough time to get through as much of the game as I wanted, seeing as this is already going to be last month's news soon, I had an interesting time looking at the inspiration that eventually spawned Final Fantasy Tactics. While I think Tactics Ogre Reborn is definitely overhyped by some of its fans, it does hold its own thanks to the stellar story with its branching narrative and decent combat system. And if things get too grindy, the AI works well enough to get what needs to be done, done. All while you spend your time doing more important things, like giving this video a thumbs up and subscribing to my channel to stay up to date with my new releases. There's not much else to say, and I want to get back to playing, so I'ma get off of here now.